Hello, or actually good evening from Germany. Um, I would like to first thank the organizer, Nikolai, for giving me the chance to present our research here, and it has been a really great content so far. Um, so during the next few minutes, I'm going to talk about um, a technology called digital microelectronics and our approach to use it for proteomics analysis of few cells, an approach which we see as a proof of principle study. Now, having this audience, I don't have to introduce you to the emerging field of nanoproteomics and how increasingly important it will become to analyze few cells or even single cells. But to start with, um, I want to elaborate where we began with this project and why we ended up with digital microfluidics. So in the beginning, um, we essentially wanted to analyze a few hundred mammalian cells, and we're looking for a method that enables us to prep these cells uh, in small volume. Therefore, we needed a technology which um, avoids manual pipetting and also can handle these volumes. Um, it should also combine all steps of the sample prep uh, in one device or container. Um, we wanted to produce uh, samples that we can directly analyze by LCMS and to avoid overly expensive lab equipment. And last but not least, um, we are looking for technology um, which could allow further automation and in future also higher throughput. Um, well, we came across this emerging technology, digital microelectronics, which can meet these requirements, but previously has mostly been used for genomic, uh, genomic sample prep or diagnostic assays, but not that much for proteomics. Now, I want to spend a minute or two to talk about digital so microidics or short CMS and introduce you to the main principle. Um, as you will see in this video, if it plays now, as you will see in this video, um, where we use uh, colored liquid, by DMS, we can control droplets on an electrode array by the application of electric potentials. This allows us to load sample onto the so called DMS chip and to dispense droplets, move them around, and if we want to, also merge them uh, or subsequently mix them. So for proteomics, that means we can step-by-step -step, um, at different reagents for sample prep and mix them with our sample without any pipe stick. So the DMF chip you have just seen is a so-called two-plate DMF device. The two plates are arranged uh, in a way um, that forms a gap in between the plates where the sample is essentially sandwiched and incubated. The ship consists of a bottom substrate, which is made of glass and sand electrodes. On these electrodes, the dielectric coating LNC is applied. The top plate, on the other hand, is made of an ITO glass slide. Now, both these plates are eventually coated um, with hydrophobic Teflon AF, which prevents any droplet sticking. To now move a droplet around, which is sandwiched between the two plates, um, to move from one electrode to another, the electrodes are actuated by an AC potential, with the top plate always put to ground. Um, the underlying physical phenomenon is uh, electrowetting on dielectric which means that the wetting properties of a liquid on an insulating surface um, as the dielectric perlene C um, is modified by an electric field. But this is actually a physical science field alone and I don't want to go into detail here. So where to start if I want to do digital microfluidics? So we found a small box called Dropbot. It's from a startup company, Cybots, which is kind of a spin-off of the research group of Aaron Wheeler's um, research group uh, at the University of Toronto. And Aaron Wheeler is uh, one of the pioneers of the day's DMF. So this device has quite a small footprint, is cheap, and it contains all electronics you need. And uh, I would consider it a tool for really simple basic method development. And it has a very wide range of applications, uh, but the throughput is not so high. And uh, we also purchased these glass ships from Cybot. And uh, as an off note, these are actually produced in the clean room. Um, they have 90 electrodes you can use, but the dropout has uh, the capacity to actuate 120. So, there, so there's room for more. Uh, of these 90 electrodes, we have eight reservoir electrodes here where we can load samples into the chip. OK, moving to proteomics, you could ask yourself, why aren't many people already using DMS to move proteins around for LCMS analysis? 
So one inherent problem to overcome is that we need the hydrophobic surface of these chips um, to ease the movement of aqueous droplets. But proteins, as you all know, tend to absorb to hydrophobic surfaces, which leads to so-called fouling of the surface. We can overcome this by the addition of detergent. And the best anti-fouling properties are found for so-called uh, block copolymer detergents. These detergents contain, uh, contain a hydrophobic center which passivates the hydrophobic surface of the chip. And their efficiency to prevent fouling was also previously shown by investigating fouling by fluorescent labeled protein. Also, some of these detergents are cell culture compatible, which is very important for us when we load cells onto these chips. So there is a way to prevent protein adhesion to the surface, but these detergents also have their disadvantages. One class that is very often used in DMS is the poloxamer class. These very large molecular weight polymers are known as the peronic surfactants, and some people um, might, already, might already have noticed um, the PEC motifs in these polymers a very common contaminant in LCMS and hard to get rid of. So we wanted to use these detergents um, on the chip, but at some point to remove it. And for that, we used the well-known proteomics method, SD3. So we already heard yesterday about SD3, um, but for those not familiar, uh, I'm quickly gonna walk, walk through it. So in this protocol, proteins are non-covalently bound to magnetic beads. To achieve this immobilization, organic solvent is added to a mixture of proteins and beads, which leads to an aggregation-like reaction. This was introduced by the lab of Jerome Kriegfeld from Heidelberg, and since then, multiple modifications and applications have been published. So how does it work? You uh, have your proteins, let's say lysate, with all kinds of contaminants, especially detergents, chaotropes, and to these, you add your beads. By using a magnet, we can immobilize the beads and rinse them with organic, removing all the contaminants. You then add your protease of choice, and after digestion, obtain a clean digest. So the great thing of SD3 is that you can use it for a variety of lysis protocols. And it's, it is easy to do and relatively cheap. But most importantly, it has been shown that you can uh, process very small protein samples. So we are going onto the chip to remove our peronic surfactant. For that, we load some beads onto the chip where we already have a protein sample containing peronic surfactant. We then place a permanent magnet uh, on the chip to make a bead pellet. And I just want to note that today we already have a more elegant technical solution to pellet the beads than this magnet. Um, yeah, with this solution, we can actually pellet uh, several bead samples at the same time. Um, nevertheless, when we have our bead pellet, we mix it with a protein sample and add acetonitrile to the mixture. This instantaneously leads to an aggregation of the proteins on the bead. Then we can easily remove the contaminants and rinse the sample again with organic. To have an idea about size here, the electrode side length are about 2.2 millimeters and the volume of the droplet is around one microliter. So can we be certain that SD3 removes these surfactants, which are quite big? Yes, we can. We can measure them in the organic supernatant of the SD3 by mol DMS. What you see here is a characteristic mass distribution of the peronic F127, um, which can be derived from the first SD3 step. When we measure the supernatant of the last SD3 rinsing step, we don't detect any polymer anymore, and we have a quite low LOD for this uh, polymer protection. So this is great. If we now compare a digest of BSA that remained on the beads, we got a nice clean peptide mass fingerprint, whereas without SD3, we saw quite strong ion suppression by the surfactant. Now, I don't want to keep you waiting. We not only analyze BSA, but also mammalian cells. We have the human T cell leukemia jerker cell line in the lab and like to use those for method development. And when we take, let's say, 100 cells in one microliter, um, but we also tried 500, microliter, uh, 500 um, cells um, and have them in PBS with one of the cell friendly peronic protectants. 
Um, we can unload one microliter of cells into one of the reservoirs of our chip. And the same way at lysis buffer. Our lysis buffer contains high concentration of urea, 1% um, anti-40 detergent, DDT, and tetronic anti-fouling surfactant, which is closely related to the peronic. So after an on-chip uh, lysis, we also alkylate with IAA and clean our lysate with the just described SD3 um, on-chip methodology. And this then removes the urea salt and especially the detergent we don't want. So in the last step, the digestion, we still need some detergent to move the droplets around. Here we move to an LCMS compatible detergent, the sulfur beta in SD314. This is actually a component of the in vitro zone LCMS solubilizer by Thermo, and we just made a slightly different buffer composition optimized for our purpose. And you might remember um, from Ryan Kelly's talk yesterday, the DDM surfactant, um, which actually works quite similar to our surfactant. Um, this is just a switter ionic um, surfactant, uh, which also eludes very late uh, in the chromatography with high percentage of LNT. After an eight hour digestion, um, the beef of the chip with crystalline life C, we actually and unfortunately still manually aspirate um, the digest using pipe tips. Um, those are the uh, gel loading type of tips from uh, Appendorf, which have very fine tips, and we use them to aspirate the sample from the chip. And this is something that we definitely have to tackle, and I will present one possible solution later. So the analysis was carried out on our Q Executive Club. And I've got to say that this, works, uh, this work was mostly focused on the sample prep. So back then, we didn't optimize much for the LCMS analysis. The setup contains a 50 centimeter pep map column, and that is what we usually use for um, bite proteome analysis in our lab. And going to small sample amounts, there's definitely room for optimization. So, despite the simple setup, when we analyzed 500 or 100 jerked T cells prepared on chip, we could identify almost 2,500 proteins on average from 500 cells, and up to 1,200 from only 100 cells. We wanted to compare this to a tube protocol using low volumes and piping. When we analyzed this from Eppendorf low bind tubes, we only got around 600 protein, ID, protein IDs from 100 cells with much higher deviation. So looking back on our on-chip results, we got twice as much IDs. You might say jerker T cells are very easily light, which is true. But I want to present an example where the compatibility of SD3 with various reagents is quite helpful. From our biology department, we very often get samples of the model organism C. illa This nematode has been widely studied, and the fascinating thing about it is that the adult worm has exactly 959 somatic cells. But their cuticle is not very easy to light. So we asked for some singly ticked worms and loaded these onto the chips via our reservoirs, and usually, when we load them, they stay alive on there. But when we added lysis buffer with SDS and pretty high concentration of DDT to, dis to disintegrate the cuticle, after 10 minutes, you could see that the worm is getting disrupted and doesn't look very good. Using then SD3 and our typical workflow followed by digestion, we also got more than 2,000 protein IDs from a single worm. With that, I already want to make a first conclusion of our results. Um, our DMS SD3 protocol allows us to do the complete workflow starting from the cells. And in case of the dropouts, the instrumentation is not extensive. There's potential for further automation, and the same applies for miniaturizing the workflow. Um, so, for example, it has been reported that with smaller features um, on these kinds of ships, um, you can handle about 200 nanoliter droplets. And with other DMS systems, even lower volumes can be possible. So for anyone interested, the work with the Joker T-cells has been published last year in the Microelectrics Journal Lab on a Chip. But we are, seeking, uh, we are certainly seeing room for improvement. As I mentioned, we haven't optimized the LCMS method. So we are currently working a lot with um, FAMES on our fusion LUMOS, and also with low ID nanobore columns. 
Furthermore, we aim to implement direct sensing of exact and also lower cell numbers directly onto the chip. And we also like TMT and approaches like ScopeMS, which is why we are working on an optimized buffer detergent system for on-chip labeling. This also comprises a direct sample transfer um, of the merged TMT samples into the sample loop of the LC. Uh, I'm going to show you our solution in a second. But to give you an idea where we are heading in the future, I already said we see this as a proof of principle study. Uh, we want to transfer these methods to larger DMS devices um, to process multiple samples in parallel. And for that, we are currently partnering with other groups um, for the technical development. So to tackle the problem of sample transfer, we developed an interface between these DMS chips and Dianex as a Dianex UC1000 auto sampler made of low cost, low cost components. So briefly, we use an external six port wells to switch between the normal auto sampler needle and a very fine capillary that fits into the gap of the DMS chip. And the control of this um, switching valve is carried out automatically by a user defined program of the UC1000. So also to stay in the time frame now, I'm just going to show you how it looks uh, attached to the UC1000. Um, you have the external switching wells um, in close proximity to the auto sensor switching wells um, and the excess capillary to aspirate sample from the DMS chip, while the auto sampler can work just as usual. So at the moment, we are still doing technical testing, but hope that uh, soon we can present some data. Yeah, with that, I would like to finish and to briefly thank my PI, Andrea Solai, who is the main driver behind the project. And also our student, Anna, um, who helped a lot with the Maldium essays. Uh, as well, of course, uh, all members of the group and Otmar Janssen, who in the beginning supplied us with these cells. So thank you for your